back in the Jesus days, back in the early 70s, we were all into one way. We had the one way sign, one way shirts, and one way everything. It was important for us to emphasize to people that Jesus is the way and there's none other. You say, well, that sounds exclusive. It is exclusive because it's true. He's the only way. Today we're going to be speaking about the deity of Christ and we're in John chapter 14. And actually, I think I'm gonna back up all the way to the uh, first verse and we'll read through verse 11. You remember that Jesus is speaking to his disciples on the evening before his passion on the cross. This is the Last Supper. And the disciples had troubled hearts over the news that Jesus gave them that he would soon leave them. But as to where he would go, they were not clear. Christ calmed their fears by encouraging their faith in himself. Basically, he was just telling them, you can trust me. Uh, he's faithful, you can trust him. You don't need to know exactly everything that's going on. Just trust me. He explained his mission in part during his absence. He said that he was going to prepare an eternal place or home for them. And then he assured them of his return. He loved them and he desires to be with his people for eternity. As we learned in our Sunday school this morning, it's important to keep in front of our hearts and minds the idea that Jesus is coming again. He's coming soon. Now, Christ had explained about his death and resurrection many times before. But as yet, the disciples just seem to be dull-witted. They just don't understand. They just don't get it. And so we begin reading in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled, Jesus said. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, or how can we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you now, O Holy Spirit, to guide us as we consider it and take it into our spirits and into our hearts. Change us and transform us by your word today, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus Christ is both the way and the end of the way. I said this last week, if I were trying to tell you where my home is, I was born in Detroit, raised in the Detroit area, moved to Florida, lived there for 35 years. All our kids are down there. I'm living up here in Northeastern Michigan now uh, for seven years. And uh, you say, well, where is home? 
I can tell you where my earthly home is. My earthly home is wherever Carolyn is. That's where my earthly home is. If I went back down to Florida and left her up here, uh, she'd be cold, but I'd be lonely because I wouldn't be, at, I wouldn't be at home. You understand what I'm saying, right? Jesus is both the end of our faith and the way of our faith. Have exp having explained the end to his disciples when Jesus said, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you so that where I am there you can be also. He was describing eternal fellowship with himself. And that's where we're heading for. I've heard people say, oh, that guy is so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. I don't like that phrase. I don't like it. I don't know that you can be too heavenly minded. I have news for you. I'm looking forward to being with Jesus. And even more so as each day passes. Well, Jesus now explains that he is not just the end of our faith, but he is also the way. Now, I'm sure you know that the early church referred to themselves as the way. That's what they called themselves. Jesus is both the means of eternal life and the object and goal of it. We want to be where he is. The disciples knew Jesus. And because they knew him, he could declare to them in verse 4 that it's no secret where he was going to go. For he just revealed it to them. But even though they do know where he was going and the way to get there, they don't realize it. It's just kind of like obvious to us now reading this, but to them, they just didn't get it. Have there ever been times in your life that you just didn't get it? I, I've had many times like that. <laughs> or, or it's almost like I wake up and I say, well, why didn't I see that before? It's right there. What Christ says is true. Even if the disciples don't get it completely, they don't realize it fully, they did know Christ's destination. And they knew the way to that destination because they knew him and he was both. Home is where your loved ones are. It's a comfort to realize once again that Christ knows our hearts and our minds even better than we know them ourselves. That encourages me. Now look at Thomas's statement. <laughs> Thomas is rightly nicknamed the doubter for he directly challenges Jesus' assertion. Thomas saith to him, Lord, <laughs> we know not whither thou goest, or how can we know the way? He's like that little boy that used to be on television years ago. What you talking about, Willis? <laughs> you know? So what are you we don't know what you're talking about. Lord, we don't know where you're going. Notice that Thomas here talks as if he is speaking for the group. Um, I wonder if there were some of the others in that group that looked over at him and said, oh, I wish he'd be quiet. <laughs> why, why, did he, why did he say that? But Christ has just explained that he was going to his father's house. He just explained it. Thomas, you should understand. And he said, oh, we don't know. And how can we know the way? Well, we don't know where you're going. I'm going to the father's house. His confession of ignorance is a good thing, I guess, because even good men can be in the dark at times. And I suppose if you're in the dark, at times, it's, it's better to just own up to it. When you don't understand something, it's probably smarter just to say, I don't understand that. I don't get that. So in, in that sense, uh, Thomas is, uh, uh, could be commended. 
But the reason for his ignorance was wrong. For you see, both he and the other disciples anticipated a temporal kingdom, a kingdom of this world with pomp and power of which they would hold prominent positions. They thought Jesus was going to remove the political powers that be and that everything was going to be fine because the old party is going to be voted out and the new party is going to be voted in. Well, Jesus had time and time again spoken to them of how his kingdom was a spiritual kingdom. And he wasn't, he didn't come to challenge Rome. Well, look at verse six where Christ gives the answer. He, he just tells them, he said, look, Thomas, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That familiar verse explains who Jesus is. He's the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to the Father but through Jesus. The way. Notice that is the way. There's only one. It is by Christ that we have access to heaven, for it's through him that we have forgiveness and cleansing from sin and from no other. The way, the one way to heaven is Jesus himself. We follow our good shepherd. Back in the Jesus days, back in the early 70s, we were all into one way. We had the one way sign, one way shirts, and one way everything. It was important for us to emphasize to people that Jesus is the way, and there's none other. You say, well, that sounds exclusive. It is exclusive because it's true. He's the only way. But notice here, he's also the truth. He's the only truth. All other claims of uh, being saviors of one sort or another, all others are fakes and pretenders. Christ alone is the savior. I have news for you. I don't even want to, I don't even want to go the, down the, I, I don't want to go down the list of the names of false gods in this world. I don't even like to repeat their names. But can I tell you something? There is no other name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. You, you can only be saved through Jesus. He is the truth. All others are fakes and pretenders. And I don't care whether they call themselves religious figures or philosophical uh, teachers or psychologists and psychiatrists. They're all fakes and pretenders. Jesus alone is the Savior. But notice also, not only is he the way and the truth, truth, but he says he is the life. Christ is to our souls what our souls are to our bodies. Without him, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are separated from God, and he is the one that gives us life. Now in verse 7, we have a statement, a clear statement. Jesus' undeniable claim to be God himself. If you had known me, you should have known my father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Jesus was no mere man. In fact, I shouldn't even say it that way. I should say Jesus is no mere man. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is eternally existent with the Father, full of grace and truth. It's a clear statement of his deity. You can't say Jesus never claimed to be God. He did right here. But Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Aren't you listening, Philip? Now, this is an earnest request for a further experience with God. I guess, I guess you can pat Philip on the back for that. He wants to clearly see and know God. But even saying this was kind of a slam to Christ himself. For here, his beloved disciples, Philip included, have walked with him for three years, and yet they're not satisfied with him. There's got to be more than this. 
That's not very nice. Here's Jesus, exactly what Philip wanted to see. Here he is standing in front of him. God in flesh, Emmanuel. And yet Philip says, I don't get it. I don't get it. Sometimes what we want, what we desire is standing right in front of us and we don't get it. Well, look at Jesus' answer. Have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. Philip is reproved over two things. First, that though he's known Christ for at least three years, he's known him intimately, yet he has not improved his acquaintance with him enough to even know his true character or who he is. We've been, Carolyn and I have been married for 47 years. I think that's right. Is that right? 47. You know, there are some times where I'll look at her and I'll say, who in the world is that person? <laughs> now, I know her better than anybody other than the Lord. I know her better than anybody. And she knows me better than anybody. But it's here is, here is Philip. He's been with Jesus all this time, and yet he doesn't know who he is. You don't realize that this is God in flesh standing there talking to you. How can we be for so long just hearers of sermons and yet so weak in our knowledge of Christ, who he is? Do we not walk with him and talk with him? Do we not come to the garden while the dew is still on the roses? Don't we know Jesus? Do you, do you talk to him? Do you listen to his voice? Don't you know him? As I said, those of us that are in the church for a long time, boy, we are good sermon hearers, aren't we? And we analyze the sermons and we try to figure out, okay, is that guy orthodox or has he made some mistakes in what he's saying? Too bad we're not as attentive to hearing Christ's voice and knowing him personally. You know, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God of Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Did you know that God is knowable? Not just like, like I know a lot about Abraham Lincoln, but I don't know Abraham Lincoln, you know. I know a lot about Donald Trump, but I don't know Donald Trump. It was different. I know Jesus. I know about him, but I also know him. I hope that's something you understand. His prayer was wrong, Philip's prayer, and it was a prayer. Show us the Father. His prayer was wrong. How often our prayers go unanswered because we ask amiss. The answer is staring you right in the face, Philip. And yet you're asking for more. Now, as I said, I want to back off here. I don't want to be too hard on Philip because I know that his thinking is clouded and he doesn't see clearly. And that's the way we all are from time to time, right? And so he wants to have a more uh, clear perception of God and, and, and everything, all the truths of the scripture. But let me just tell you this. I think the answer to all of our questions is all wrapped up in the way, the truth, and the life. It's all wrapped up in Jesus himself. What are we to believe about Jesus? What are we to believe about Christ? Well, he speaks of himself and the Father as two distinct persons, and yet they are one as ever any two were or can be. Do you see that? 
You see the Trinitarian theology right in there. Jesus is saying, I and the Father are one. He's, he's making a distinction between the Son and the Father, but they are one as ever any two were or can be. We are to called to believe him and to follow him. They call us believers. That's because we believe who Jesus is, that he is the eternal son of God. The third person, or the second person of the Trinity, that he's eternally existent with the Father, that he is Emmanuel, God with us. We are called to believe who he is, but we're also called to believe his words and his works. Because his words, as he says here, and his works are both from the Father. They're both from the Father. I have encouraged you to study the scriptures, to study the word of God and to know the word of God. And uh, I encourage you again here today, read the word of God. The Bible is a lamp to your feet. It's a light to your path. It's spiritual food. It's the bread of life. You need to know the Bible, read the Bible, love the Bible. You are to um, be hungry for the word of God and hungry and thirsty for righteousness. But you wanna know something else. I think it's important to know his works too, his works in our life. We sing, God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, he's so good to me. Um, why don't you be a little bit more specific with that? <laughs> How has God worked in your life? How do you know God, not just by his works or words, but by his works in your life? It's my contention that if we would uh, count our many blessings, name them one by one, it would surprise us what the Lord has done. We could see him and his goodness through the works that he's done in our lives. I don't know about you, I, I guess when you stand in front of a group of people like I am this morning, you have a tendency to lay bare uh, your own heart and your own soul. And I'm, I'm gonna risk that right here now this morning with you. There's many times that I scratch my bald head and I say, where am I? What am I doing? Where am I going? What's happening? Sometimes I feel clueless. Does anybody ever feel that way? Or am I the only one? Well, if you feel that way and you are like me, let me just kind of tell you where I've been able to come with it. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way. I need to follow him, faithfully follow him. He's the truth. There's nobody else. There's, it's just Jesus. Don't go looking for somebody else because there isn't anybody else. You just cling to him and he is the life. He is my life on this earth and he is my life in eternity. I don't know about you, but I got a mansion being built for me. Now, what's that mansion going to be? Is it going to be a country estate or is it going to be a condo? I don't know. Doesn't matter to me because the main thing is it's going to be where Jesus is. I'm going to be living with him in the father's house. It doesn't make much sense for me to try to figure out what that is because completely because Jesus already told us that it hasn't even entered into our minds what the Lord has prepared for those that love him. But I know this, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And as long as I'm with him, I'm okay, no matter where that is. Corey Ten Boom, and I'll close with this thought. Corey Ten Boom was quoted as saying, you remember, she was the one that spent those years in the concentration camp, saw people dying, saw her sister die. I'm not sure whether this was Corey Ten Boom's statement or whether it was her sister's statement before she died, but it was one of the sisters. 
said that there is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. Jesus can go with us and is with us in every situation. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, Father, we thank you for your word, and I thank you for this time that we've had to consider it. And Lord, we are sometimes dull-witted like those early disciples, and we don't get things even when they're obvious in front of us. And Lord, even as I'm talking here to these folks, I see it in my own life. Sometimes the truth is standing right in front of me and I don't even see it. Forgive me for that, Lord, and help me illuminate my mind and my heart. Oh, Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me into all truth, I pray. And then, Lord, I pray that you would bless my friends this day, give them a good day, and keep each one of them uh, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.